Okay, welcome to the second to last week of this course. So we have, oh, for one, I hope you guys had a decent weekend. Um, it was nice the first half of the weekend. It was really, well, to, to say it was really rainy, the, the second half, I think, was a bit of an understatement. Yesterday, specifically on Monday, it was uh, torrential rains. Well, it seemed like torrential rains. Um, which is another, you know, climatological phenomenon. Well, it's actually weather, but, you know, if this happens over time, it becomes our climate. Um, anyway, so that aside, I hope you guys uh, had, had a productive weekend. Um, all the remarks on your tests have been completed. The marks have been updated online. And I believe the drop date was yesterday. So I suppose that means if you're still with us, it means you're with us uh, to the end, for better or for worse. So it's kind of like marriage in that sense, I suppose. Um, okay, I think those were all the announcements. Um, yeah, th this week is pretty standard. There's a lab due on Wednesday. Um, you have an assignment due on not Friday because your midterm's on Friday. So I think your I think your assignment is due on Sunday, uh, two days after because you know you've got the midterm on on Friday. So I gave you a bit of a breather on that one as well. Um, okay, anyway, I think those are all for the announcements. So let's move on. So we have concluded the the traditional narrative in, in this course, um, the narrative being electromagnetism. And I described before that electromagnetism is governed by four main equations called Maxwell's equations. So the first of Maxwell's equations was Gauss's law, and that was primarily focused on in the first test. And then the other three Maxwell's equations are Gauss's law for magnetism, Faraday's law, and Ampere's law. Um, they are focused on or will be focused on, on the, in the second midterm on Friday. And um, Gauss's law for magnetism governs magnetostatics and that pretty much just says that there can be no magnetic monopoles and that the magnetic field lines have to loop around home. You know, they're, they're not, I mean, they're infinite in the sense that they go around in a circle, but they do not stretch on for infinity. They have to loop back on themselves. And then Faraday's law and Ampere's law together, they govern the realm of um, electromagnetodynamics, so like motion. And you saw in those two equations that one of them involved a changing E field inducing a B field, and the other one involved a changing B field inducing an E field. So those two equations will work in conjunction and um, actually create sort of a positive feedback loop at times and we will actually talk a little bit more about that positive feedback loop in our last chapter, which we will get to next week. Maybe, well, maybe later on this week, but definitely next week for sure in electromagnetic radiation. For now, we have a sort of transition chapter. The transition chapter is, is going to be um, reflection and refraction and geometric optics. So we're going to be investigating physical properties of light is really what we're doing. And the reason we're doing this as a segue chapter is we are trying to build toward a, a more fundamental understanding of light. And um, this is important because light is in essence an electromagnetic wave. And electromagnetic waves are governed by Faraday's law and Ampere's law in conjunction with each other as that, uh, with that positive feedback loop that they mentioned. So we will finish this course revisiting um, re well, sort of revisiting that notion and talking about electromagnetic radiation. But before we do that, we're going to take a little bit of a breather and change gears a little bit and do, and do some geometric optics. So um, you, your last lab, not this lab, this is, I think you're, the lab due on Wednesday is the magnetic fields of coils lab, but your last lab, lab number four, is going to be on reflection and refraction. So this is the lecture that sort of will help you with that. Okay, so the first thing is um, that you need to know with light, there is the principle of reflection. Now, what that simply means is that um, whatever ray, whatever light ray comes in, it will naturally hit at some angle theta. Let's call that, well, this image is called it theta A. Um, by all means, we can call it theta A. Uh, I like to call it theta i for theta incident, but you know, tomato, tomato. And the, the um, law of reflection says that if it hits a reflective surface, so this could be like a piece of glass or a mirror, um, what have you, 
then the light ray will actually reflect reflect at an angle theta r in such a way that the incident angle is going to equal the reflected angle. So what goes in comes out with exactly the same angle. Now, you might be asking yourself, okay, this is a fundamental uh, principle of reflection, but why? You know, how does nature know to, to abide by this sort of principle? And looking at light as a wave, um, perhaps is, is not the most intuitive way to really understand this sort of equality, theta in equals theta out. Um, however, if you, if you consider light to be a particle, which that notion has been introduced to you in both grade 12 chemistry and first year chemistry, um, you know, like a photon, for instance, then you can actually invoke sort of, if you, I'll say this, if, if you think of light as a particle, then the law of reflection can be thought of as conservation of momentum. And I think this, this is easier to maybe get your head wrapped around. You know, if, if you throw a basketball or a tennis ball or a bouncy ball um, at a brick wall, then it will bounce at the same angle that it, it hit at. Uh, because of conservation of momentum. So um, if you think of light as a photon, it's very much the similar, a similar principle. In fact, um, I know photons don't have mass, but it is true, in fact, that photons do have momentum. So this is, this is more of a direct uh, analogy than, than some might think. But anyway, we're, we're kind of digressing a little bit. The, the takeaway point of this is the incident ray, the angle of the incident ray, will equal the angle of the reflected ray. Now, another principle of geometric optics is, um, yes, reflection is one of them. The other one is what happens when the, when the light ray gets transmitted, not reflected, but transmitted. It, it permeates into or through the new material. Now, we notice a phenomenon occur. We, we notice that when the light ray travels in, um, the path that it, it looks like it should take is this red dotted line here. You know, if, if you were to trace trace this path all the way through uh, in a straight line, it should travel there. However, it bends. What we do notice is, in fact, it gets bent. And this is what we call refraction. Refraction is the act of, of a ray bending as it enters a new medium. Now, in order to quantify this bending, we need to introduce a new metric because this bending is, is a, a characteristic of, of the material. So if it's a characteristic of the material in some way, we need a variable or a quantity to numerically represent this, this characteristic. In the same way that you know, mass in kilograms is a characteristic of an object, the moment of inertia is, is um, you know, the rotational equivalent of mass, again, a characteristic of the object. Um, size is a characteristic of an object. So, you know, there's lots of different characteristics that the substance can take, you know, um, its material is glass, maybe it's plastic, who knows, but specifically the characteristic that we want to, to put a number to is what about it causes it to bend, how much bending will happen. So we call this, this characteristic, we call this the index of refraction, meaning um, the, the higher the index of refraction, the, the more bending will happen. So the higher this characteristic value, the more bending. Now, how is this, this um, index of refraction defined? Well, first, we have to fully appreciate what causes the bending. So picture this. Let me, on, on the side here, I'll say what, what causes the bending? Because in order to come up with a formula to characterize bending, we have to first appreciate the source of the bending, what, what uh, fundamentally is causing the bending. So here, I want you to picture something. Picture a road and um, 
you know, you've got this yellow solid line in the road, um, you know, and let's say you have a car traveling. Oh boy, now I have to draw a car, don't I? Let's see here. Whew, I don't know how to draw a car at all. That's not bad. Okay, so let's say there's a car driving forward. Okay, so you're driving on the right hand side of the road. Now, what happens, now for those of you who have driven in Canada, um, you, you might appreciate this, but in the winter time, the roads are plowed and smooth, presumably, but this shoulder of the road might be slushy and snowy. Um, even if you're not uh, appreciative of a Canadian winter or driving in Canadian winter, maybe you can be appreciative of gravel. Um, so like, let's say, let's say the, the shoulder here is, let's say, um, gravel, or let's say it's grass or gravel, something with a lot of friction, something where a car would not naturally like to travel on very smoothly. So what happens if you drift? If you're driving and you take a small drift and your, and your um, passenger side wheel catches the new medium, meaning the shoulder, whether the shoulder be slushy roads in the winter or the, or the shoulder be grass or gravel, you know, something with a different amount of friction. Um, then what happens is if you're driving, you'll notice that your car actually veers and gets pulled into the, the shoulder or, or gets pulled into the medium. Now, the reason this happens is because the speed the speed of this tire slows down while the speed of this tire remains constant, right? It's unimpeded. There's nothing slowing it down. So what happens is the right side of the car has slowed down. The left side of the car is at the same speed. So you're going to get this sort of pivoting motion, this rotational motion, uh, and, and you're gonna drive or get pulled right into the shoulder. That's bending, that's, that's effectively what's happening here. Analogous, analogous, we have, let's say we have air on this side, and let's say we have glass on this side. If you have a light ray, I'm zooming in here, so um, you can't, of course you can't really zoom in and see the see the edge of a light ray, but let's assume you can for a second, use your imagination. Here we have the edge of a light ray. And if it's hitting at a certain angle, it's hitting at a certain angle, theta i, then what's going to happen is this corner is going to slow down first. And this side over here is going to continue to continue to travel fast. So that's going to cause a bend or a change in the path. So it, it appears your eyes would think that it wants to go this way. However, because this slows down and the, and the other side of the ray is unimpeded, it actually bends and it ends up going something like this. So the source of the bending is, is specifically the fact that the speed of this ray, this light ray, is actually different in the, in the new medium compared to the old medium. So it's a difference in speeds of the light. Nothing more. It has nothing to do with the physical density of the material. It has nothing to do with the type of, I mean, I guess inherently it has to do with the type of material in that the type of material, different materials have different speeds, but there's nothing inherent about, you know, it being glass versus like conceivably there is a glass out there and a plastic out there where they both happen to have the same um, speed of, of light in, in their respective materials, right? So there's nothing, in that sense, there's nothing specific about the material. Really, the, the quantity of the material that governs the bending is the, the speed of the light ray in that material. That's it. So, what we can do is we can define 
the index of refraction, the, the amount of bending that will exist, to be the, the, the speed of light in a vacuum. We, we call this value C. C is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of light is the speed limit of the universe. There is nothing that can travel faster than the speed of light. Um, and as there, someone who shall rename, uh, remain nameless, there was a math prof at UTM who decided to poke fun at me for being a physicist. Um, and they, they actually did it wrong. They, they cited physics badly. And they tried telling me that nothing travels as fast as the speed of light. And I, I had to correct them and say, well, no, that's not true. Uh, light travels as fast as the speed of light. Uh, I think you mean to say nothing travels faster than the speed of light. And uh, then they're like, well, you're just, you're just splitting hairs now. I said, well, you're the mathematician. That's your job, but whatever. Anyway, so anyway, uh, index of refraction, n equals c uh, divided by v. v is going to be the speed in that medium. So we can see here um, the index of refraction is, is actually a, a ratio of how much slower the speed is in that medium compared to the fastest possible speed. So if the index of refraction is 2, then that means it's twice as slow in that medium compared to the fastest possible speed of light in a vacuum, which would be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So the higher the end value, the more bending, because the higher the end value, the slower that speed would be in that material. So that's the first equation from this chapter, is the index of refraction, n equals c over v. Now, how does this help us quantify the amount of bending? Well, as you can see in the diagram here, there's a lot of angles going on. The amount of bending is given by something called Snell's law. And Snell's law is something uh, sometimes written as follows, sine of theta incident divided by sine of theta refracted equals n refracted divided by n incident. However, this next slide, um, I, I, personally, I personally like this representation of Snell's law uh, a little bit better. Not because of any physical reason, just because of memory reasons. So you'll notice that in this representation of Snell's law, the, the, sub, the, the sub indices are flipped, right? It's sine, sine theta incident. They use A. I, I like incident because it makes more sense. Uh, divided by sine theta refracted over n refracted divided by n incident. You'll notice here that they're on a diagonal, right? If, in, if, if, if theta incidence is on the numerator on the left, then n incidence is on the denominator in the right. To me, that's just another thing you have to remember in addition to the structure of the formula. And, you know, it, the, the less often you use this equation, the harder it is to remember. The other rearrangement of this, the one that I like, the one that I've boxed in green, I personally find it easier because everything is on the same side. You know, the pattern is going to be n sine theta, and then you just remember that it's n i theta i, and then you got the same thing on the other side you know, n sine theta. It's the same pattern, n sine theta, n sine theta, n sine theta. And then the, the subscripts are refracted, refracted, right? So that all the subscripts stay together. I, I personally find that easier to remember, but whatever floats your boat, they're all the same. So um, there, are two, there are two equations that govern um, refraction, re, sorry, reflect, oh, I can't even talk, reflection and refraction. The first is theta in equals theta out or theta reflected equals theta incident. And the second is Snell's law. That governs refraction. And that's where you have the, the index of refraction of the, of the medium one times the sine of the incident angle uh, times the index of refraction of medium two times sine of the refracted angle. OK. Now, 
you can actually put, in the diagrams I just showed you, um, we were only looking at one light ray. You know, you can, you can put this into perspective by kind of zooming out in your head a little bit and say, well, in real life, you know, light, light isn't really generated one ray at a time. I mean, maybe in some lab somewhere in a earth controlled experiment you can, but for the most part, when you turn on a light bulb, many, many rays come out. Light coming in from the window, many, many rays are coming in from the window. So analyzing one ray is, is not really useful. Now, if you put them all together, you actually get a, a, something that actually makes sense with what we see. So there's two types of reflection. There's, there's a coherent reflection where the surface that it strikes is smooth or relatively smooth, even on the microscopic level. So when the light comes in, the light comes in parallel, as you can see, right? So presumably, you know, this light is coming in from, let's say, the sun. And the light coming in from the sun, the sun is so far away that whatever light is coming in from the sun is, is effectively parallel. And if, the, if it strikes the surface and the surface itself is smooth and flat and well behaved, then all of these are going to strike with the, same, with the same angle of incidence, which means they're all going to reflect with the same angle of reflection. And then here, you're actually, if, um, if I were to draw an eye, an eye with some eyelashes and maybe a pupil here, um, I'm going to label this I just because if I don't, you guys may not know what that is. Um, if, you, if you put your head there or your eyeballs there, then what you'll see here is a nice, sharp image. Oop, image has an M, not an N. Image. And, uh, you know, typical things is like a mirror. You know, when you, when you look into a mirror, mirrors are flat, they're smooth. And you know all the rays that hit the mirror um, coming in that are parallel, they all hit with the same angle of, of incidence, so they're all going to get reflected with the same angle, and then they're going to be coherent, and then you know your eyes are able to see an image out of them. Now, the opposite is actually what I find to be more interesting, in my personal opinion. How do we see things? Well, the way we see things that something exists is light will strike an object and uh, reflect. So really what we're seeing is we're seeing a reflection of the object, interestingly enough. Now, if an object is green, let's say, then really that, what, what, what that means is when white light hits that object, it absorbs all the colors of the rainbow except for green. And it actually reflects only the green light and absorbs all the other colors of the light. Now, why, can, why can't we see our reflection in, say, a door? You can see the door. You know, you, well, for one, you know the door is reflecting light because you can see it. That's, the, that's literally the mechanism by which you can, you can see light. Or, sorry, you can see objects, is that they, they reflect whatever color of the, we're going to call it. They reflect that light. So there is reflection there, but why can't you see your face in it? Well, if you zoom into, let's say, a door, um, you're going to get a surface that looks like this. So, you know, most objects, most objects have rough surfaces. And when I say most, I, I literally mean everything except something shiny. <laughs> everything except where you, where, where you can see your face in it. Um, and what, what that's doing is you still have parallel sun rays coming in. The rays are still coming in coherent and, and uniform and parallel. However, when they strike the surface, you see here the surface is uh, sort of on a downward decline. And you have, you know, one theta value here of incidence, but if you look at a different ray, let's say this ray here, it has a different angle of incidence. Now, they're still coming in parallel, right? The, all the light rays coming in are all parallel to each other, but because the surface it, itself 
is, is sort of rough, then when they actually strike the surface, then the, the angle relative to the surface is different for all the rays coming in. And the principle of reflection says you always get reflected at the same angle that you hit at. So even though they come in parallel, one, one ray might get, you know, reflected way off in no man's land. Um, another ray might get reflected backwards, again, depending the shape of the surface. And you don't, if, if you were to place your eyeballs here, you're going to get no image. All you're going to, I mean, eventually some light rays might hit your eye. So that tells you there's something there, but there's no coherent image formed. So it tells me that there's an object there and, and, and I can see the door, but that's why you can't see your face in the door because the, the light rays that make up your face, you know, the, that are coming from your face, in order to see your face in the reflection, all those light rays from every bit of your face, your forehead, your eyebrows, your cheeks, your nose, your lips, you know, they have to be reflected and they have to stay together. You know, if, if those light rays kind of get scattered, then your lips might be over in left field, your eyebrows might be over in right field, and you know, no one part of space has, has the full image. So you don't, you don't get an image that way. So this is actually, I find this, it's called diffusive reflection. I call, I personally think diffusive reflection um, on the surface seem, seems chaotic and complicated and boring, but I think it's the most interesting because it actually explains why you can see objects at all and why you can see objects, and sorry, why you can see your reflection in some objects and not in other objects. Um, just an example of this is when you polish or wax a floor. Now, we don't really do this in our personal houses, but you, you might know that, notice this in schools, like in stairwells or high schools. Um, in September, when you first start school, the custodial staff would have had all summer to, to um, you know, use their industrial machines to like scrub the floors and clean the floors. And then they put a fresh coat of wax on top. Well, when they do that, when you put a fresh coat of wax on top, then the wax fills in all the gaps and creates a nice smooth surface. And then by the end of school, July, June, whenever that happens to be, you know, it's gone through a full school year of tracking dirt in and the dirt gets stepped on and then you get little divots and then rocks get little divots. And then in the winter time when salt comes in, the salt crystals, you know, again, divots and it dents the layer of the wax. And then it, it goes back to being diffusive reflection. But uh, when you have a nice fresh coat of wax on it, the surface is smooth. And uh, if you look hard enough, you can actually see your reflection in the floor. Um, the same is true, again, if you're from Canada and you're embracing this sort of culture in Canada, the same is true when you have um, a Zamboni that, um, what do they call it, Sur that resurfaces the ice. You know, when you're skating on the ice with your skates, um, when you do skate stops and you're turning, you know, you're taking the blade on your skate and you're carving uh, a section of the ice and that creates uh, divots in the ice. And what a Zamboni does is a Zamboni not only collects all the snow from all the, you know, skate stops and stuff like that, um, it pumps hot water over a cloth and the hot water um, melts the top surface of the ice. So not only does it collect all of the debris on top, but it melts the surface of the ice and then, and then it refreezes it because there's, there's cooling coils underneath and it refreezes the ice and uh, then it refreezes with the top very smooth surface. So often when you're skating, you won't, you look down, you can't see yourself because it's covered in snow and it's bumpy and all this other stuff. But um, after the, the Zamboni, when you get on the ice, um, it's shiny and you see that glare. And if you look hard enough, you can even see your reflection. So you can actually ex you know, experience these sort of um, specular and diffusive uh, reflections in your own lives as well. I mean, even around your house. I mean, you're looking at a door to see that the door exists. That's diffusive reflection. You can see the door, you just can't see your, your reflection. If you look at a mirror, not only can you see the mirror, actually you can't really see the mirror. You just think it's a parallel universe you can walk into, but 
maybe if the mirror is dirty, like fingerprinty, you can see the mirror, but more specifically, it's still a flat surface, so you can see your face. Anyway, so that's just a really cool property, I think. Um, I digressed a little bit. Let's get back on track. So here, let's look at some properties uh, comparing two materials. It's not just from air, but let's say like from, from an arbitrary substance A, which could be air or it could be something else, into substance B. So I don't know why the diagram chose to label this. This is substance A, but for some reason they labeled NB on this side. I don't know why. So I'm going to scratch this out. They're saying NB is bigger than NA. So that's, that's like... That's like saying NA is less than NB. I don't know why they, they wrote it the flip. I don't, that's whatever. I'll just change it. So here they're saying a ray of light that is entering a material that is known to have a larger index of refraction, the ray will bend toward the normal. That is, the ray, if you were to extend the ray, your brain should think that the ray will end up going straight. However, the ray gets bent toward the normal, the normal meaning perpendicular, perpendicular to the, to the, in, um, to the inter, interface here. So the, this is the normal, right angle 90 degrees. So it gets bent toward the normal. So if you have a light ray that goes into a slower medium, it bends closer to the normal, closer to the 90 degree mark. Uh, in the next few slides, we're gonna look at the index of refraction of some common material. So you can get some intuition um, for bending. Now air, air is a pretty common one. Air, the index of refraction of air is, is effectively one. The speed of light in air is effectively the same as that in a vacuum, effectively. Um, so when we're talking about light coming from air into water or light coming from air into glass, you can always pretty much predict it's going to bend toward the normal because air is, has an index of refraction of one and everything else has an index of refraction higher than, than one, higher than air. So um, anyway, there's that. But then, then there's the question of like, what if it goes you know, from water into glass. Well, then you, then you kind of have to know water is 1.33 and, you know, you, what kind of glass. But anyway, we'll get to that shortly. Um, now here, another property is if you shoot a ray uh, straight on, straight on here, then it will actually pass through undeflected, regardless of what the end values are. And the reason for this is, I mean, you can look at Snell's law. Snell's law is N incident sine theta incident equals N refracted sine theta refracted. So here, if, if theta incident is zero degrees, because you, you're, you're aiming it straight on, then if you're solving for the refracted angle, then you're going to get uh, ni over nr times zero, which equals zero. So you get sine of theta refracted equals zero, which means theta refracted equals zero degrees, which means if it, if it enters at zero degrees, it will pass through into the new medium with a refracted angle of zero degrees. Again, this should make sense according to the law of conservation of momentum. If you throw a wrecking ball um, at a brick wall, it will go through the brick wall and go straight through the brick wall. If you throw a wrecking ball at an angle on a brick wall, the wall itself might fall over, but the wrecking ball will, will bounce backward at an angle. But the point being is if you, if you throw it in straight, it'll go out straight. So all of this, please, please try to, you know, bring back your prior knowledge of momentum here. That, that intuition will help you a lot. Um, and then the opposite is true. Um, if you have, again, they, they insist on writing this backwards. I do not know why. If you have NA bigger than NB, then instead of bending toward the normal, it bends away from the normal. So, you know, again here, if you trace 
the path that your brain thinks it should go, then instead of bending toward the normal, we see that it bends away from the normal. So um, without doing any complicated math here, this is just a, a qualitative description, quality, like quality attributes, concepts. You know, if you're passing into a, an, a more optically dense material with a higher index of refraction, it'll bend toward the normal. If you're traveling, uh, or if light is passing into uh, something less op optically dense, then it will bend away from the normal. So let's look at some uh, examples of n values of common relative or common or relatively common uh, things. So ice, like solid H2O is, is ice. Um, it has an index of refraction of 1.31. Now liquid water has 1.33. Where's that? There's got to be somewhere. Liquid, there's water right there. So ice actually has um, uh, a slightly, slightly lower index of refraction, which means it actually travels, um, light travels a little bit faster in ice than it does water. Um, so polystyrene is a type of plastic, so 1.5 or 1.49, um, so that's pretty slow. Um, it could get slower, I suppose. Um, quartz, quartz is a, I mean, for, for some of you who have a renovated kitchen, or live in a condo, a relatively new condo downtown, you'll probably have quartz countertops. Now they can put coloring in there to make it white, in which case it's opaque and, and maybe not completely translucent, but um, quartz naturally is, is relatively see-through um, if you don't add coloring to it. So, you know, had you had un, undyed quartz and light could travel through it, um, it would be even slower than even polystyrene. It would be 1.544. Diamond is uh, one of the slowest, one of the, one of the um, materials that is known to be the slowest for light, one of. Um, light travels the slowest in diamond. Now, I mean, of course, there's, there's this thing listed here, rutile, um, but it's not very common. It's not really a, a thing that comes up very often. But diamond is relatively common, you know, diamond rings, for instance. So um, jewelers who have to sort of gauge whether or not a diamond is real, they actually use properties of geometric optics to, to determine whether the, the rock they're examining is in fact a diamond or if it's something fake. And they can use known properties of light in diamond um, to, to see how the light behaves. Does it refract as it should? You know, is the speed of light in that material as it should be for a diamond? Um, glass. Now, um, in physics courses and, and in a lot of problems you do in your homework, crown glass is, is a pretty common type of glass that is cited in these physics problems. So it has an index of refraction of 1.52. Um, water is another common one that you'll see in physics problems, 1.33. And um, the other ones are, are sort of less common. I mean, they, they still exist, but they're just sort of less common in a physics course. Um, but they're included in this table because, you know, if you're a chemist, for instance, you might be, you might be using benzene quite a bit um, to do beer Lambert law or something like that. So it's helpful to know the index of refraction of some of the more common chemicals if you're in a different discipline. Okay, so I've done enough talking. Let's do an example. So let's use uh, Snell's law here in context. And again, this, I, I specifically uh, cherry picked this example uh, from lecture slides because it's, it's kind of how I live my life. Um, I don't know, I don't really, I'm not a good fisherman in any way, shape or form, but you know, I like water, I like swimming. Um, I love scuba diving. Um, and every time I just do things that most people would just find simply fun, uh, I always can't help but just think of the physics behind it. Um, it's both a curse and a blessing, but nonetheless, you know, if I'm just sitting by the water or by the ocean or something and I see something underneath, uh, I always think to myself that that object is not where I, my eyes think it is. I always have to, if I want to go reach for it, I have to reach for it somewhere else. So let's, let's look at the math and the physics behind that. So here, you kneel uh, beside a fish pond in your backyard. Okay, for one, who has a backyard nowadays? <laughs> Especially if you live in the GTA, uh, who can afford a backyard? 
Um, anyway, let's assume not only do you have a backyard, you have a big enough backyard that you have a fish pond. Um, and you look at one of the fish. Um, maybe perhaps you're, you're at the waiting restaurant of, of uh, the Mandarin and you're waiting to be, actually it's during COVID, so hopefully you're not at a buffet right now either. So I guess ignore that. Anyway, um, you see it by the sunlight that reflects off of the fish and reflects at the water air interface. If the light from the fish to your eye strikes the water air interference at a known angle of 60 degrees, again, I don't know how you're gonna know that in advance, but anyway, let's pretend you do, um, to the in, uh, interface, what is the angle of refraction of the light ray? A lot of words there. All this is saying is you have a light ray that's coming from the fish. And don't forget, this is in the water. And the, the way in which your eye can see the fish is that there's a light ray from the fish hitting your eye. Now, it doesn't travel in a straight line from, your fish, from the fish to your eye. Once it reaches the air, that's a change in medium. And a change in medium means Snell's law will kick in. So then we get this bending that happens. And it looks like your eyes will be deceived because the light ray appears as though it should, not that it does, a should travel straight out without being bent. However, it is bent. As you can see here, it's refracted. Now, if you look at the previous slide, um, it's going, or not the previous two slides here, it's going from a large index of refraction to a small index of refraction. So the light ray should bend away from the normal. And that's what it does. The normal is the black dotted line here. This is the normal. So the, the light ray bends from here away to where the red line is, which is the real light ray. So here we set up Snell's law, n incident sine theta incident equals n refracted sine theta refracted. Now, everything is always measured from the normal, so please be careful. The diagram here, or the question mentions 60 degrees, but that's 60 degrees um, from the air-water interface. The math of Snell's law always measures the angle with respect to the normal. So if the angle of the interface is 60 degrees, then the angle with respect to the normal is 90 minus 60 degrees, which is 30. So here, this is going to be 1.33 because this is going to be the N of water. That's the incident material. It's coming from water um, times sine of 30, which is a half, times the index of refraction of air. That is the refracted material. The refracted material is up here and that's air. So that's going to be one times sine theta refracted. I think the question is wanting us to calculate the refracted angle. So going through here, the sine of 30 is, is a half. So this is going to be 1.33 over 2 or divided by 1 equals sine theta refracted. And then we say theta refracted is going to be the arc sine of 1.33 over 2. Now, Hopefully you know what arc sine is. In high school, they teach you sine inverse or sine minus one for the math teachers who don't quite know the terminology. Um, for some strange reason, in first year calculus, at least at, at UTM, I can't speak for the other campuses, um, for some reason, even in first year calculus, they still continue to use sine inverse uh, when they want to know the angle instead of arc sine. I don't know why, because sine inverse isn't a function, it's actually a relation. Um, and later in the course, um, you know, right, right before Christmas, they introduce arc sine um, as being a thing, and they somehow think it's different than sine inverse. So I don't know. So I know sine inverse is literally the button on your calculator, but um, arc sine is actually the thing we're doing. So I'm, I'm never going to use sine inverse, because I just think that's stupid. So arc sine is, is what I will use to find the theta. And if you go about doing that, um, 
then you're going to get something, um, let's see here, approximately, um, well, 1.33 arc sine, 1.33 is going to be one and one third, so it's going to be four thirds. So this is going to be the arc sine, um, it's going to be the arc sine of what, one over six, I think? No, nope, one over three. The arc sine of one over three, and that's going to be just over 30. It's going to be about, I don't know, somewhere between 35 and, and 40 degrees, somewhere, somewhere in that range without a calculator. Oh, hey, the answer's here. 42 degrees. Okay. All right. 42, 42 degrees. I was close. Given that I didn't have a calculator, that's pretty close. Now, of course, in real life, um, you're not going to know magically that the angle that the fish makes with wherever you are is going to be 60 degrees, right? That's a manufactured problem. Um, however, um, before we move on, I want to illustrate something. And this is kind of what I was mentioning earlier. Where do you, where do you think the fish is? Well, you, all according to your eye, you think the fish, the light ray from the fish is coming from here. And that hits your eye. So where do you think the fish is? You think the fish is actually out over here. That's where your brain interprets seeing the fish. So, you know, those people you see in movies that can just like reach into the water and grab the fish or, you know, you're spear fishing, you see a fish and you throw the spear at it. The reason, well, I mean, part of the reason why we suck at it is because fish are fast, but um, even, even hunters or, or people who are skilled at like, you know, throwing quickly and have fast reflexes, if they didn't understand physics, they would never catch a fish because if you're aiming a spear or your hand to reach into the water, you would be aiming over here. And the fish wouldn't even have to move. The fish would just sit there and be like, you're dumb. Like, I'm not, why are you, why are you grabbing over there? I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Like, I, I, I have learned that I just have to sit here and I won't get caught. So, you know, the, the people who are really skilled at spearfishing, they understand, at least maybe not mathematically, they understand the principle of refraction and they understand that the, the fish is actually closer to them than they appear and that they have to aim their spear, visibly aim their spear where the fish is not, which is a very uncomfortable thing for the human brain to do. Because you're like, why would you knowingly aim at something when you're aiming away from it? But you have to do that in order to get the fish. So this is an example of kind of how knowing physics can help feed you in the, in the, in the wild which is probably one of the very few claims that physics would actually do <laughs> help you in the wild in terms of sustenance, but anyway. Um, so here, this is what this slide is sort of talking about. It, it's the apparent angle, for instance. So, you know, if you have um, two pins, well, let's say they're colored pins, just for the sake of fun. Let's say you've got a red pin here, and a green pin here. Maybe they're the light bulbs for all I know. Maybe they're Christmas light bulbs. Um, now, light rays would go from the light bulbs, they would go into the glass, and it's going from air into glass, from index of refraction one to index of refraction 1.33. So it's going into a larger index of refraction. So it bends toward the normal, right? The normal being here, bends toward the normal. Um, and then once it's bent, fine, then it continues to travel through the glass. And then it goes from glass into air, from slow to fast, from a slow moving, optically slow moving medium to an, fast op an optically fast moving medium. So here's the normal, uh, let me, different color. Here's the normal. Um, the light ray would want to go, well, I mean, our eyes would think it wants to go straight, but it in fact bends away from the normal because it's going into a faster medium and then uh, continues to our eyes. So the question is, 
where where do we see these these Christmas lights or these pins? A, B, or C? And the the answer is A, because um, you see here that let me erase these doodles. You see here that this is actually parallel to this, right? Because of it, like this starts out in air and this finishes in air, which means at the end of the day, the direction of the light beam will, will have to be the same. But because there's glass in the middle, you're just sort of translating the image. You're moving the image, you're not distorting the image, you're just moving the image because it goes air something to air. The beginning and the end points are both air, the same medium, which means after all is said and done, the, the trajectory will be parallel, just shifted. So B, B is not correct because B is a, is, is a rotated, um, or is it B or C, whatever. B and C, they're not parallel, they're rotated with, with respect to one another. So because we finish off in air, we know it won't be rotated, it'll just be translated. So A, and well, in fact, you can actually see it if you trace back, trace, 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 trace your eyes will think that the two pins or the two lights uh, originate from, from within the glass, which is kind of really cool, but they don't originate within the glass. Okay, so this brings us to um, another rearrangement of, of the um, index of refraction equation. So we use this equation in physics 136. Um, in first year, we call this the wave equation. However, in physics, I think if a physicist heard me call this the wave equation, I would be disowned by physicists. So um, if anyone's watching this later, yes, I'm aware this is not the real wave equation, settle down. But for all intents and purposes, I'm gonna call this the wave equation. So if you recall from 136, there is a very standard kinematics equation, V equals D over T. And um, this is assuming there's no acceleration. Now, if you have a wave that is you know, in space, then we want to characterize the wave. Then we say, okay, what are the properties of the wave? Well, the physical distance between two peaks, peak to peak, we're gonna call the wavelength. But the wavelength is a physical distance. You can measure it in meters. If, if, if you had a wave long enough, you could literally measure it with a meter stick. And um, what is the time it takes for the wave to travel a full cycle or a full wavelength? Well, the time it takes for it to travel one complete cycle, by definition, is called the period, capital T. So you can actually say this is going to equal lambda over T. Now, it is very strange to refer to the period of a wave because the period of a wave can change as a function of material. The period, I mean, as you saw in physics 136, the period, the speed of the wave was a function of tension in the rope or, or you know, the, the, the density of the rope and thus the, the, the wavelength was also uh, affected that, uh, by that as well. However, the frequency of a wave is constant no matter what medium it's in, which is interesting. So instead of representing this by period, what we're going to do is we're going to represent this by, um, by frequency. So frequency and period are one over each other. So this is going to equal lambda f. So that's where this equation comes from, v equals lambda f. It's, it's really just the, the um, v equals d over t equation. OK. Now, we can use that to uh, plug in t for v in our n equation, our inductive refraction equation. So we know the speed of light in a vacuum is going to equal lambda in a vacuum, f in a vacuum. So solving for c, we can plug this in here. We can say lambda not frequency over, and this is going to be lambda um, times frequency. 
lambda naught being the, the, the wavelength of the, the light wave in a vacuum and lambda being the wavelength of light in the material. Now, as I said earlier, the, the frequency of, of, the, of the wave is actually not a function of medium. The frequency is whatever the frequency is. It could, it could go from air to glass to water to, to, to ice. Uh, and in, in each transformation, it will have the same frequency as it did before. So you can actually cancel the frequencies. And that's just generically true. That's true with light waves. That's true with, with oscill oscillatory waves. Well, actually, that's not quite true with oscillatory waves. It depends if there's damping, but anyway. Um, anyway, here, with, especially with light waves, this is true. And uh, you're going to simplify, and you're going to get lambda naught over lambda. And so that's where they get this rearrangement from as well. OK, now we're getting close to sort of some you know, fun, more advanced concepts. Here, we have some Carney mind tricks. You can set up your mirrors in, in this sort of way. So if you have two perpendicular mirrors, as follows. Um, if you have an incident ray coming in, oh boy, what's going on there? If you have an incident ray coming in, hitting at theta 1, then you know it's going to reflect at theta 1. So you're going to have a reflected ray hitting here. And this hits a second mirror that we have conveniently placed. And uh, it's going to get reflected backwards again. So if you had your eyeball here, you could actually see the object. Maybe there is uh, an, an object here. Maybe, maybe it's an apple or something. I don't know. So then you're going to see, you're going to see the apple here which is kind of really cool. And um, for those of you who have been in sort of a fancy elevator, so presumably not any of the elevators at U of T, but maybe at like elevators at a hotel or a condo building or something like that. Um, I've, it, I, at least in my experience, I've seen elevators, because elevators are usually small, they usually line the walls of the elevators with, with, um, with, with mirrors. And um, you know you can actually see sort of like the the side of your head uh, pretty easily in one of those because because of the sort of geometric pattern of reflection you get you know the side of your head shines into one mirror on the side it gets reflected to the mirror in front of your face and then and then the, the image of that gets reflected uh, into your eye so you can very easily see the side of your head for instance um, in in uh, an elevator. This is actually also the same principle when you go to the barber. Um, I don't know if, if salons do the same thing. I know, I know, you know, in, in most barbers, like with, with a male haircut, um, you know, they don't do anything fancy. They just kind of cut the back and you can see the front of your head in the mirror in front of you. And then they hold up that sort of mirror behind you. Um, and then you can see the back of your head in, in the mirror in front of you. And again, it's the same principle of, of two mirrors working, working together. Okay, anyway, that's just a fun application. Um, here's a practical application. Not only is this fun, um, this, is, this is actually uh, very, very practical, in addition to being very fun. This is called total internal reflection. Now, for those of you who live in Canada, you'll be very familiar with the company Bell, Bell Mobility or Bell, Bell Communications. Very Canadian. If you're not in Canada, you will no, never have heard of Bell. But anyway, um, they, Bell has a monopoly in Canada on fiber optic transmissions. Um, they call it FIBE TV or FIBE Internet. And it's a way for them to achieve really high speed internet. But not every region in Canada has FIBE Internet because you, instead of traveling through phone lines, instead of the internet traveling through phone lines, the internet travels through fiber optic cables. And the cables have to be dug and laid and placed into the ground and you know, right up to your house. So there's infrastructure involved, but the major parts of, of the city will have um, fiber optic cable. And the reason why this is good is because instead of sending electric um, uh, internet and, and information through electrical signals, they can actually send it as light. And light um, not only travels much faster, it can carry more signal as well, more bandwidth. So let's, let's kind of look at kind of what Bell FIBE internet is all about. 
So it takes advantage of something called total internal reflection. What is this doing here? Well, if you have n i sine theta i equals n r sine theta r, presumably we know, um, this is actually an argument of, of intermediate value theorem, um, if you remember first year calculus, Presumably, you can understand that if you shine scenario one, you shine a light straight on, and it, it will go straight through. Scenario two, you shine a ray of light at a bit of an angle, let's say theta A. Then it will be refracted, and let's say, um, let's say this is slower, and this is faster. Then it'll bend away from the normal, uh, sorry, no, this is, I said that backwards. This is faster. Sorry, this is faster. So something like air, for instance, and this is slower. So something like glass, I don't know. Okay. Um, so if it goes into something faster, it'll bend away from the normal. And scenario three, or actually, let's skip scenario three. Scenario four, if you, if you go beyond, um, it won't bend at all. It'll come back in. So there must be something in the middle where it goes perpendicular, uh, well, perpendicular to the normal or parallel to the uh, interface. So here, what we can do is we can set the refracted angle equal to 90 degrees. We can reverse engineer at what angle do we need to aim our, our laser or light at so that the refracted angle comes out along the surface of the, of the interface. So we can say, okay, um, n i equals sine theta i equals n r times sine of 90. Now the sine of 90 is conveniently one, which is nice. So we're gonna call this angle, we're gonna call theta i theta critical. We're gonna call it the critical angle, the angle at which if you aim the ray of light, it will not pass through and it will not come back. It'll travel along the surface, 90 degrees to the normal, the surface. So we're gonna call that the critical angle. So we're gonna get sine theta critical equals N refracted over N I times sine of 90, which is one. So frankly, it's quite simple to see that the critical angle is going to be given by the arc sine of n r over n i. Now, arc sine, if you recall, the domain of arc sine is between minus one and one. Now, you can't have, you can't have negative n values. So um, even though mathematically arc sine can take in negative values, that's not of consequence here. But point being, um, that tells us that the ratio of nr over ni must be less than or equal to one in order, um, in order, in order for a critical angle to exist. Now, the only way in which the ratio can be less than or equal to one is if ni is larger than nr. So this is really saying that ni is larger, oops, than nr. And what that means is you're going from a slow medium into a fast medium. That's the only way that there exists a critical angle. Now, lucky for us, that's, that's usually fairly easy to do because air is all around us and air has an index of refraction of one. So usually it's, it's fairly easy for us to go from a slow medium into air, which is a fast medium. So what ends up happening here is um, let's say you have um, an incident laser beam. I'm, I'm drawing with black ink on black 
there we go. Let's say you have an incident laser beam coming in and it's being shot at relatively perpendicular. So this is how you get a laser beam. Again, if you shoot it at perpendicular, the laser beam is gonna pass through unrefracted um, into the water. Now, once you have light in the water, then it strikes the edge. And here we go, we have a slow medium and then air uh, outside is a fast medium. So slow to fast, we have the potential to have a critical angle. And here, um, because of the geometry of this fishbowl, it just so happens that this theta here is, uh, theta i, is, is gonna be beyond, it's gonna be beyond the critical angle, which means it doesn't pass through, it gets reflected back in. So you see here, it, it bounces, 100% bounces off, and then right here as well, this angle in, of incidence uh, is going to be larger than the critical angle. So instead of coming through, it's going to get 100% bounced back in. And it's going to keep doing that until it strikes the surface at a value where theta is, is smaller than the critical angle, and then it'll escape. And that's what total internal reflection is. Total internal reflection means the angle of incidence is beyond this critical angle and no light is able to escape. So what you can do, oh yeah, yeah, I already derived this. So, you know, what you can do is you can manipulate this and um, even before fiber optics, we, we've, we've built, optical devices using this. In fact, this is what a prism is, quite frankly. This is one of the things um, that prisms are used for. So prisms are designed in such a way, um, you know, let's say you want to use um, glass. Well, I don't know, crown glass, for instance. I think crown glass, if I remember correctly, had an index of refraction of like 1.56 or something along those lines, I can't remember. So, you know, if you, if you want to, um, if you want to calculate the critical angle of glass, you could say, okay, theta critical is gonna be the arc sine of um, N glass over N air and arc sine of, I think crown glass was 1.56, I think, I can't remember. So that's going to be in and around, well, I guess 41 degrees according to this. I, I may have been misquoting the end value for glass as well, but anyway. So you can calculate that, um, the critical angle, and then you can go back and you can say, okay, the critical angle is 41. So if you plan to have light rays shining in and striking the surface, then you want to design or cut your, your prism, your glass prism, you want to cut it in such a way that these angles will be larger than the critical angle. And if, if you design your prism in this fashion, then you are able to take advantage of total internal ref, uh, reflection. And that means, you know, for instance, in the sense of, of, of a periscope or a microscope of sorts, then, you know, you can have light coming in here and you can actually move or offset the trajectory of light um, in, in this fashion. And this is how binoculars work. You know, so this is half, presumably this is half of the binoculars. You know, the other half, there's, there's that sort of wheel in here to adjust things. And then you have the second eyepiece for your, obviously your second eye over here. That's a terrible diagram, but you know, you get the idea. So this is like half of the set of, bin, uh, of, of binoculars. And you can use these prisms to sort of uh, shift the, the, um, the, the image. Now, back to fiber optics. Let's say like Bell, Bell Communications. What, what they do is they design the material of the fiber optic cable to have you know, a, a very generous critical angle meaning as a, a very small critical angle because they want every angle, they want many possible angles to be larger than the critical angle. And what they do is they are able to send information 
through a beam of light. And there's, there's various ways you can do that. You can modulate the frequency. You can modulate the amplitude. Um, in fact, AM radio is called amplitude modulation and FM radio is called frequency modulation. So um, those are two very common ways to transmit information over light or, or electromagnetic waves. And once they encode the information, then they can send it into the fiber optic cable. And um, again, if designed properly, then the critical angle uh, of this material will be quite small, which means the, the cable can be flexible. You can bend it. I mean, you can't, it can't be a sharp bend, but it could be like a smooth curve bend. Um, and it, at that point, it almost doesn't matter what, what the angle is because it, it will be designed, that material will be designed to have a very generous, very small critical angle, which means at every turn, it's going to be reflected back in. And pretty much you can, you can literally um, just like do something like this. You can have light enter, uh, light enter the tube and you know, the tube can bend and then you can see the light. Um, you can see that exact image without distortion on the other end. Now, if we were in person, I would actually show you this um, in, in person. Uh, we have lots of equipment at school to show you this. Unfortunately, we don't have much of them here. So, or I don't have any of them at, at my house. So, um, but you can definitely Google this. I would recommend definitely like YouTubing, YouTube um, total internal reflection. Uh, it's very cool. I, it, it's a very cool uh, phenomenon. Okay. Um, this, this here sort of uh, explains the sort of um, the, the fundamental principle, pr uh, principle of what causes the bending. I explained this earlier with the car and, and the, the gravel side, um, what do they call it, shoulder, the gravel shoulder or the grass shoulder. This is pretty much saying if you have a wave, oh boy, what happened there? This is saying if you have a wave front that um, of light, so this is going to be a light wave. This is a better drawing, I guess, of, of what I drew earlier, where if you have a car that comes in or a light wave that comes in, this part is going to slow down first. So in a, in a given moment of time, let's say delta t, then because it's traveling slower, it will be, um, the distance it travels will be smaller than the distance the other side travels in the same amount of time. Because this is going to be traveling at speed VB while this still travels at speed VA in the same amount of time. So this distance is going to be larger. This distance is going to be smaller. And then um, that's going to cause a rotation or a bend because the left side or the right side is going to be moving slower than the right side. So it's, it's actually actually the same principle of how cars even turn. When, when your car turns a corner, um, uh, the part of the wheels on the car inside are traveling slow compared to the wheels in your car on the outside. They travel faster to, to, to make the, to the car turn. Um, the last thing I kind of want to mention before we move on to geometric optics is that um, there's, a, there's a notion called, oh, red with red doesn't work. There's a notion called um, dispersion or scattering. And it's uh, very complicated and mathematical, but the, the concept is actually quite beautiful. So I'm going to leave the math mostly out of 137 because it just gets really mathematical for, for uh, no, no good reason at, at this level. But the premise is actually very fun. So what does dispersion mean? Dispersion means that simply the index of refraction is actually a function of wavelength. And that's not always true, okay? So not, not every material um, exhibits this, but many of them do. Now, you can see here as a, for instance, um, let's say like, like um, fused quartz, whatever the hell that is. Well, the index of refraction of fused quartz is, what is this, halfway between, this is what, 1.45, so maybe this is 1.46, I don't know, it looks like 1.46, okay? 
Well, this is saying, this graph is saying that the index of refraction for blue light infused quartz is about 1.46. But the index of refraction of red light infused quartz is maybe about 1.455, slightly less than 1.46, for instance. That is diffusion, but fused quartz minimizes diffusion, meaning any, any light in the spectrum, whether it be red light or red light, uh, mostly, mostly has the same index of refraction meaning if you put white light into fused quartz, then every color in that white light, red, blue, orange, green, indigo, violet, um, Roy G. Biv, um, every wavelength of that white light will bend at the, same, uh, at the same magnitude and stay together and then emerge as white light because they'll bend together mostly. However, let's say flint glass, Flint glass, however, its diffraction curve, or sorry, its dispersion curve is much steeper. So you see with flint glass, blue light has an index of refraction of something like 1.66. However, red light in flint glass is something closer to 1. Point, um, let's say 1.61, just above 1.6. I'm making up the I'm making up numbers here, but it's close. So this is saying that red light has a lower index of refraction. So the amount of bending that red light has is less than the amount of bending of blue light. So if you pass white light through flint glass, then what you end up getting is that red light will bend less than blue light. And what that's going to end up doing is separating the colors. So that's actually dispersion is how, let me write this down, dispersion is the mechanism or the principle, I'll say the principle, the principle by which a prism uh, separates white light uh, into colors. Okay, so there you go. Um, pretty much a rainbow is, is I guess really what I'm getting at. And seeing as how, oh my, what is happening there? It's got to be something with the tablet. Rainbow. So um, that's a very quick superficial introduction to rainbows. Um, in fourth year physics, if you remember, Brandon was our lecture TA last semester. Um, Brandon had just finished fourth year physics uh, with me, classical electrodynamics. And we talk about dispersion right at the end of that course as well, but we do it in much more rigorous detail. And I think the conclusion of, of um, physics 451 uh, in April was pretty much rainbows are cool. <laughs> that was, I think those were almost verbatim my words, where after uh, an hour and a half of, of dispersion uh, lecture, I finished by saying rainbows are cool. So that's what I'm gonna do here as well. This is a very superficial introduction of dispersion. Uh, the premise is that uh, different wavelengths of light exhibit different amounts of bending. So if you have a dispersive medium, like flint glass, for instance, then you can take advantage of this and split white light into its components. Okay, um, also rainbows. Now, there's something called the double rainbow. Um, I, we don't have time to talk about a double rainbow. We're already, we're already behind. So uh, I won't mention double rainbows, but I will say that the premise of a rainbow existing um, is also dispersion. There's water droplets in the air. Um, typically after a large rainstorm, you get a rainbow and um, uh, water is also dispersive, sort of. Again, it gets complicated. So um, when you have fine water droplets, it becomes very dispersive, and um, you can you can separate white light into 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 components, and that's how you get that's how you get rainbows in our atmosphere. Okay, um, this pretty much concludes uh, reflection and refraction. 
So there aren't too many new equations, thankfully. There's theta in equals theta out, pretty straightforward for reflection. Um, we've defined uh, the index of refraction of a material, n is equal to the speed of light in a vacuum C divided by V, V being the speed of light in that material. And then we introduce Snell's law. N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two. So those are really the only equations, uh, new equations presented in this chapter. Uh, the rest of it is largely conceptual. Um, I, I would say, fortunately, although students historically don't like physics concepts, you guys like to memorize. So um, I will caution you, perhaps, that although I believe it is fortunate that there isn't a lot of math in this chapter, um, I will caution you in advance that um, most of this is conceptual. You have to understand the mechanism by which light slows down. That's, that's not a mathematical description, that's more of a conceptual description. So there's a lot of concepts that play in this chapter, and it's important that, I know you're studying for the midterm on Friday, but it is important that you do understand these concepts because, um, you know, at this level of physics, we aren't doing complicated math. We're mostly testing on, on your ability to know physics, right, not, not produce math. So anyway, uh, I'll stop the recording here before we shift gears into the new chapter. So I just want to keep those, those videos separate. So if you're watching on YouTube, I will see you in the next video.